Lord, we worship you this morning, Almighty God. We are grateful that God was manifested in the flesh, died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead on the third day. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The name above every name is the name of Jesus. It's the name whereby we must be saved. It's the name by which we are healed and delivered from demons. It's the name above everything. You're the creator. And Lord, we just come to you today and we exalt you. You're the one true God. You're the God of all gods, king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. We worship you today. There is none higher than you. There is none like you. And we exalt you and we worship you and we thank you, God. You've given us your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth. You've given us your word, the Holy Scriptures that are all God breathed. We thank you for it, Lord. You did not leave us without guidance or a teacher or comfort or truth or instruction. You gave us what we needed. And we thank you for it today in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Hallelujah. Good to see everybody here today. Those watching and listening out there all over the place. Oh, man. Well, you know, see, since it's cold and raining outside here in Alabama, there's nothing else to do. So we got plenty of time, right? We'll just take our time this morning and go through this. Um, I'm going to tell you, this this topic angers the devil because... Uh, that I'm going to be on today. And, it, and, and we're continuing, I guess we're going to call it the knowing series. Stuff you got to know, right? There's things you got to know in the spirit. There's things you got to know in your head, right? You just have to know some things. You got to understand some things. We got to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God. Amen. Um, we're going to call this one today, Knowing the Prophets. Now, we've been on a little series that I didn't even plan. It just keeps going. But it was knowing Jesus, knowing the Holy Spirit, knowing the Lord's voice, and then knowing things to come. I talked about that last week and talked a little bit about prophets, that God will speak through prophets. Now, um, let's put up. We're going to start today. We're gonna, this is a teaching today. It's also going to name some names. I'm going to upset some folks, but I'm sorry. I'm going to play some video clips today that, you know, is going to be very incriminating upon certain individuals. Um but uh, let's go go first and to, um, God, there's just so many places I want to go with this today. But let's go first. Just go to Matthew 24 first, and let's read that. And then, uh, well, no, no, I'll tell you what. Go to Ephesians 4 first, and then we're going to Matthew 24. All right? But Ephesians 4, start at verse 11. Let's put that on the screen. We're going to read down through that. Because I want to say at the outset of this, I believe in the fivefold ministry, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers uh, for the, and I believe they're still for today. That means apostles and prophets as well. But that doesn't mean I think everybody who calls himself an apostle or a prophet is one, okay? Let's get that understood right now. But I'm not the, the other camp that says that, that those two ministries somehow cease to exist because that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, but let's read this, and again, let's see what the purpose of this fivefold ministry that God gives to the church. He said it's a gift to the church. So these are gifts that the church needs to grow and to flourish. Um, I'm sorry, but there is authority in the church. There's leadership in the church, and if you don't like that, I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Uh, That's why we got a bunch of lone rangers out there that just have YouTube ministries, but they, they're not part of the church in the sense that they have no affiliation, no accountability, know anything to a true fivefold ministry they're just giving you what they think and that's why paul said there's you may have ten thousand instructors in christ but you have don't have many fathers and as he's talking about those who have maturity walked with the lord for a very long time and know and they're not ashamed that they are called to the fivefold ministry you know i get i get criticized sometimes because i say i know i'm called to the fivefold ministry but how did paul address all of his letters Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. You think he was afraid to say, this is what I'm called to do? Peter said the same thing. Peter, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. They called Philip, Philip the evangelist, right? They called Agabus, Agabus the prophet. Right? It's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not odd. 
Uh, Acts chapter 13, it said they had certain prophets and teachers in the church in Antioch. So that means they distinguished. There were prophets and teachers. There were pastors. There were shepherds. There were elders. There were deacons. These are different callings. You are, you, God has to call you to, right? Now, he doesn't call everybody to these. You know, there, there are some chiefs and then there's some Indians. We're not all chiefs. I'm sorry. That's just not the way God designed it. And that's okay, because let me tell you something. The chiefs have more responsibility and are going to be uh, stand under greater condemnation at Judgment Day. Going to be held uh, to a higher standard because there was a greater responsibility to preach and teach the truth. And really, to tell you the truth, these folks out here that want to teach and preach the Word of God and act like they're teachers and leaders in the body of Christ, they need to be very careful, especially if they took that upon themselves. Um, and then especially if they start leading people astray, they will be held accountable for every person they led astray. The blood will be on their hands, and they're going to be in big trouble. But a lot of them think they're teachers, and they're not teachers sent from God. They're teachers of their own appointment. And it says here he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting, that word also means maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or the building up and strengthening of the body of Christ. Till, until, that word till, what does that mean? Until. Somebody say until. until. Say till. Okay, somebody gets bent out of shape. Means same thing. Means, guess what? These ministries are needed to perfect, equip, edify the body of Christ until we all come into the unity of faith. Has that happened? Nope. The church in the world is certainly not unified by any stretch of the imagination. There is no unity, okay? That's why we have all these different denominations and factions and all these different false doctrines and cults and everything else out here because we have not come to the unity. So we need true apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why do we need true ones? Because there are false ones. Right? Especially because there's false one. But he said here that we need these ministries until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, knowing Jesus, unto a perfect or mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? Notice that's a colon there. It says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, meaning that people who are trying to trick you and deceive you, it says whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So he said that these ministries are primarily to make you grow up in Jesus until you come into the fullness of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that you are a mature Christian, and so that you're not a spiritual child tossed to and fro by every prophet or teacher that comes along. Now, that's why you want to know why I get on these topics and why I will name names. It's because this is my job. And for the, anybody out there that thinks you're not supposed to expose error and false doctrine and false prophets and teachers, anybody that thinks that that fivefold ministers aren't supposed to do that, then you haven't read the New Testament because Paul named names, Hymenaeus, Philetus, Alexander. He named names of people who were teaching error, who were leading people astray. Paul even named one of his own associates who was faithful for a season and walked away from him by the name of Demas. And he said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He said, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him for his works. When the false prophet, Elymas, tried to turn away Sergius Paulus, you know, Paul was trying to witness to him and lead him to the Lord. And this Elymas, this false prophet, it says he called him a false prophet, tried to hinder him. Paul turned around and said, you're going to be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. Smote him with blindness. And it, it, it so upset poor little pitiful, weak John Mark that he had to run away. He just couldn't handle that anymore. Right? And we got a lot of weak, snowflake, cupcake Christians that can't handle that we have to confront sin and we have to confront false doctrine and we have to confront false prophecy. There's a bunch of false prophecies, uh, prophets running around. Okay? Now let's go to Matthew 24, starting at verse 
three. I, I, y'all ought to know Matthew 24 by heart now. My church ought to know it. I mean, goodness gracious. It's probably one of the passages that we turn to the most. It has to be in the top three. It may be number one. I don't know, but it has to be in the top three. Yeah, it has its own tag there. That's good. All right, now, but I want to bring out, again, I've read it many times, but I want to bring out the scriptures as we go through this. And he says, as he said, upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came in in privacy, saying, tell us, uh, when will these things, shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming of the end of the world, or the eon, the age? And he says, and Jesus answered and said to them, first thing, take heed, pay, means pay close attention. Don't become lazy. Don't become distracted. That's what take heed means. Pay attention, be aware, and don't let any man deceive you. Now, to deceive you means to get you off course, away from the truth of the word of God. Period. All of Satan's works is to turn you away from the word of God, ultimately. I don't care what he comes up with, how many smoke screens and circus acts and crazy stuff he comes up with. It's all designed to get you to question, doubt, move away from sound doctrine of Scripture. Because if you stray from sound doctrine, you have strayed from Jesus. Now, how do we know that? We're going to keep reading, though. We're going to turn to 2 John in just a second. He said, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, or I am anointed. It's funny how a lot of these false prophets think they're these little Christ. They think they're super, you know, just like Jesus. And it says, but look what it says. It doesn't say they'll deceive a few. It says they shall deceive many. Remember, the world's already deceived. Who do the false teachers and false prophets and seducing spirits come after? They come after you. They come after the born again Christian who has been walking in the truth of the word of God. And they want to pull you away. That's all Satan is after. He's got the world. In fact, the, the Bible is clear that the gospel's hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of those that believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. But let's, let's keep reading. He says, you shall hear wars and rumors of wars, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows or the birth pains of the end. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And we're going to stop right here. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. I don't think in my lifetime I've ever seen so many people claiming to be prophets. I mean, they're on Tiki Talk and YouTube and Instagram and they're everywhere. I mean, they just sit. Most of them don't go to church anywhere. They sit in their living rooms or the kitchen or their their bedroom office and they give you these prophecies one after. The other. And what is amazing to me is how the people of God has such itching ears to hear a, a word of prophecy nearly every day. I'm going to tell you the first sign that somebody is probably a false prophet is when they got a word from the Lord, see an angel, have a vision every single day. Or at least every other day. What's her name? It has them all the time. I can't even, we can't even keep up with her. Julie Green. Don't even get me started on that one. But if somebody's, oh, that I can go to the third heaven and, and, it's, and be in the throne room of God whenever I want to, See angels whenever I want to. Vision, vision, vision. Dream, dream, dream. You better beware. Because that's not normal. In fact, those things should be actually rare. Okay? Let's keep going. Let's go. Well, I'm sorry. We're done with that. Go to, um, go to Revelation 2. Many false prophets will rise and deceive many. That verse right there, verse 11, really has been standing out to me as I've been praying about this this week. Revelation chapter 2, I want to go down to verse 18. I want to show you something here. It's very important because I'm laying the foundation of where we're going today. We're going to talk about some of these false prophets 
some of the false prophets and their new protégés. They just keep perpetuating themselves through their disciples. Um, but let's read this. This is about the church, Jesus speaking through the apostle to the apostle John about the church of Thyatira. And he said, he said unto the angel, of the church of Thyatira, write, these things saith the son of God who hath eyes like a flame of fire and feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works uh, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, remember this, con to commit fornication, the word fornication is both physical and spiritual. It could mean idolatry, it could mean uh, a spiritual fornication or uncleanness, but it also means sexual just physically sexual sin, sexual immorality. I'm going to tell you right now, one thing I've seen when you get, when anybody gets tangled up with these false prophets and in these false prophets, they usually all get exposed. At some point, they have sexual sin in their lives. Okay? And, be, and if you listen to them and you receive their ministry and you let them lay hands on you and prophesy over you and you chase after them, Whatever they have, whatever sexual demons of lust and perversion they have is going to come off on you. You can, I have seen it for 36 years. I have witnessed it. There's always upon them a seducing spirit to seduce you into error and compromise. And when it says here to eat things sacrificed to idols, to me that represents the entire occult world, like getting you into contemplative mysticism, like... Uh, you know, Eastern Hindu Buddhist type meditation, but calling it Christian. They teach you how to visualize or how to repeat phrases and mantras over and over and over again till you, till you create a spiritual experience and you think it's the Holy Spirit and it's not. It is a counterfeit familiar spirit or Kundalini spirit, especially if you go down this road. So he says, you have this woman here. He said, you know what? Your church, you got a church. There's Christian people in it. See, let me just say this. I'm Pentecostal and charismatic, but I tell you right now, I wouldn't set foot in 99% of the Pentecostal and charismatic churches across the world. Would not set foot in them. Because they allow this false prophecy stuff and the counterfeit gifts and the counterfeit suit they never put it in check they just let it run rampant and witches love to come in those churches and act like they're prophets oh they love it that's some churches that'll have everybody come to the altar and then say everybody else in the crowd come up and lay hands on you on these folks you ever in a church like that you better run run away because they, they, they don't have, they don't have this, this simple sense about them and I don't you know what I understand why a lot of Baptists and a lot of Methodists and a lot of these people are cessationists. They want to run away from anything Pentecostal and charismatic because most of that world now is so polluted and so deceived and in so much counterfeit and in so much foolishness. I wouldn't want to be a part of it either. But I can't deny the scriptures and I can't deny the word of God. I can't deny that there's the real gifts of the Holy Spirit and the real ministry gifts. And so I made a decision a long time ago that I don't care how bad it gets. I'm going to do my best to pursue and desire the real move of the Holy Spirit, the real anointing of the Holy Spirit, the real gifts of the Holy Spirit, and not be ashamed of it and try to make a show the people of God the difference between the real and the counterfeit. And that's why I'm, I'm going to get into this book in a minute. But I wrote The Polluted Church from Rome to Kansas City in 2011, published it in June 2012. And I want to tell you, it's more important today than it was when I wrote it. And I'm going to show you why, because the things that I wrote about in this book have come to pass. Even worse, I warned about Mike Bickle in here, and, and I had people who were Mike Bickle friends that could not accept it. And now his whole sexual scandal has come out, and he's been removed. And I warned about him in 2012. But, oh, I was being a meanie. I was judging. Like, no. He's teaching. He, Mike Bickle, I'm going to show you that. He was teaching false doctrine. He was leading people to the Roman Catholic Church. He was teaching, teaching Roman Catholic mysticism. 
contemplative mysticism, having his students read books by uh, Roman Catholic priests, teaching stuff, the, the just demonic stuff from like Teresa of Avila and St. Bernard of Clairvaux and all these other people, like Henry Nowen, who is a heretic, all this stuff, he's leading these young people into Catholic, Roman Catholic, Eastern Hindu Buddhist mysticism. And I documented all in here. And I said his mentor, Bob Jones, the prophet, was a sexual deviant. And Paul Cain, they called the father of the movement, him and Bob Jones, were both sexual deviants for decades while they're prophesying over people and leading the prophetic movement in America and the world. Paul Cain was a homosexual and an alcoholic. Bob Jones was having women come in his office in Kansas City at Mike Bickle's church, taking their clothes off to get a word from the Lord. And come to find out, Mike Bickle's been doing the same thing for over 20 years. <sighs> no, there's always a sexual element. And there's always an occult element that creeps in. We got one right up the road here in Warrior, Alabama. Lord help us. That guy's talking about God lives in a big square of jello. Keep reading here. I can't hardly hold it in. I was kind of waiting to get to that. But he says that notwithstanding, I have a few things against you to this church because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. So here's the, the mercy of God. He allows these people to continue for a season because he's given. Some people say, why don't God just strike them dead like he did Ananias and Sapphira? Because he's merciful and patient. Thank God, because I'm glad he was merciful and patient with me, right? But God also says that he allows them to continue with us that he may prove us and test our hearts. See, he lets the false prophets and teachers linger so he'll see if we'll test them according to the word of God and try them. Or would that we will allow them or tolerate them or let them operate in our midst? I will not. How many people have I tossed out of here that started acting a fool? Mm -hmm. I'll do it again, too, in a heartbeat. Because he says, Jesus said here, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So what he's saying here is those who keep on following these people adultery means a relationship it means a relationship you shouldn't have but it's a relationship as long as you you continue this relationship with them you're going to end up in the same bed and the same tribulation that she's in if you keep listening and following these people and then he says this he says and i will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts, and I will give every uh, uh, give <clears throat> unto every one of you according to your works. But I say, uh, uh, but I, uh, but unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine. What doctrine is he talking about? Tolerating false prophets among you. Tolerating those with the counterfeit supernatural. Allowing sexual immorality and idolatry and compromise to be taught and be have the stamp of approval in your midst. He said, as many as have not this doctrine, he said, and which have not known the depths of Satan. Somebody say the depths of Satan. Now, a lot of us think that Satanism is the depths of Satan. And that's pretty wicked. It's pretty evil what people do in Satanism. But he says within the church, the depths of Satan is this counterfeit that we tolerate. You hear me? Because it opens you up to all kind of demonic contamination, pollution, and even possession if you continue in it. You hear me? And it even will lead to some death. Some will die because the doors are open to demonic attack. But then he tells him, but that which you have already, hold fast till I come. He that, he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, 
and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as a vessel as vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as i received of my father and i will give him the morning star and then he says he that hear hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches now i'm going to give you a little demonstration um of some of the false stuff now remember last week i gave you the scriptures god said in the last days going to power out my spirit on all flesh your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy your young men will see visions your old men will dream dreams and this is going all the way to the end when there's blood fire and pillars of smoke right and and all the way to the end the true will be here but then he told us the false will be here and in fact he gave us a parable remember the the parable of the wheat and the tares he said both will grow together until the time of the harvest until the end both will grow together. So what you have there is the wheat, the good, the good children, the, the children of the kingdom, the children that are born again, the children that are obeying and walking according to the word of God. You have them growing and maturing, but you also have the tares growing and maturing at the same time. So what we have is this, this huge clash within the church world. But y'all ready to, to see some foolishness? Let me show you some foolishness. Let's let's play the first the first first clip. This will give you a little idea of some uh, the woman's uh, prophecy about a woman's mother. That one, yeah. It's only some of these are only about twenty seconds. So make sure you have the volume up and ready to go. This is just a quick illustration. She's giving a prophecy. She's in a church. You'll see the congregation. She's talking to a woman on the phone, giving her a prophecy. And let's see what happens. Boy, this ought to this ought to. And cancer today, your mother shall live and testify the goodness of the Lord. How's your mother's health? My mom, she passed away in 2009. How do I play it again? Go ahead and play it again. It's so quick. You hey, and cancer today, your mother shall live and testify the goodness of the Lord. How's your mother's health? My mom, she passed away in 2009. How do I? She said, she, I don't know why it's stopping before. She says there, how did I see that? You didn't. Not from the Holy Spirit you didn't. Either you made that up in your own mind or, or, or demon spirit gave that to you. How bad. She's given this woman a word, a prophecy about her mother, and she's been dead for years. These people need to sit down and shut up. You make a mistake that big, you better not be prophesying for a long time till you get your life in order. Maybe never. Uh, let's do the Chris Yoon. Here's another prophet out there that's got 250,000 subscribers on YouTube. Here he is prophesying about the 2020 election. Go ahead. So today's my last day here in D.C., and if you've been following me this whole week as well as the last couple of months, you know what's been on my heart, and it's that the Lord has anointed and has appointed uh, Trump to be a president a second term. It's not 2024. It's right now in the next couple of weeks. Go ahead and play it one more time so before they hear it. He's, he, did you hear him say? Today's my last day here in D.C., and if you've been following me this whole week as well as the last couple of months, you know what's been on my heart, and it's that the Lord has anointed and has appointed uh, Trump to be a president a second term. It's not 2024. It's right now in the next couple of weeks. So now here's what's wild. I think on that, on that prophecy when I looked at it, he had 45,000 likes out of over a hundred plus thousand views. Now, do you think that this guy's repented over that and stopped his so-called prophetic ministry? No, he's still just rolling on. But what gets me is not that they these guys keep rolling, it's that the people that keep following them. In fact, from the time he gave that prophecy to the, to now, he, it, which has been what several almost four years, his subscribers have grown. And I'm like. What is going on here? What is happening? Let's do the, here, here, here's another one. This is, this is them trying to teach people how to prophesy. Uh-huh. Prophecy training 101. Here we, here we go. How to prophesy. The first thing that comes to your mind, I want you to say it real quick. Ready? 
Five, four, three, two, one. Boom. House. You said house. So now, if the house comes into my mind, that means something's going on in which your living arrangements. Like God wants to do something with your house. I want you Play it again. Go ahead. The first thing that comes to your mind, I want you to say it real quick. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Boom. House. You said house. So now, if the house comes into my mind, that means something's going on in which your living arrangements. Like God wants to do something with your house. I'm now, now this is what Bethel does. This is what a lot of the charismatic people, they, they're training, trying to teach people, train people how to prophesy. And here, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, what if it's dog crap? <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? That is about the stupid. You know what's, what makes me sad about that little clip there is that these are young people. You know what you need to be telling young people? What you need to be doing, young person, is you need to be spending time in prayer. You and the Lord. You need to be fasting. You need to be studying the Bible. You need to be find yourself. You need to find yourself some true elders, a true church, a true pastor. You need to be submitted. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Don't we know the first Peter chapter five? Isn't that what he said? You need to find that and you need to be a person of prayer and fasting and study. And if you spend time with the Lord, nobody's going to teach you anything about how to hear from God. You will begin to hear from God through the scriptures by his spirit. You don't have to have nobody trained me. Now, I learned certain principles and I learned certain testimonies. and I, I glean things from people, but I didn't sit there and go, OK, here's what you do. First thing pops in your head. Dog. Create a prophecy around a dog. Your dog just got killed. This is what they do. Your dog just got hit by a car and they say, no, it didn't. Oh, then it's going to happen. You think I'm joking, but this is what they do. And this is not the gift of prophecy. It is divination. It's fortune telling. It's hit or miss. And a lot, most of the time, it's not specific. It's so vague that it could, there could be any fulfillment. Listen, I'm going to tell you, my mom, before she got saved, this is years ago when I was young, when we were lived in California, I was in third grade. And I remember that my aunt Delpha, who was, uh, what was she? I don't, I don't remember. I think she was full-blooded Mexican. She may have been different, but she was into fortune tellers, man. She was into psychics. She got my mom to go to a psychic. To get her fortune read. And the psychic, the woman told her, basically, you're, you're, you and your current husband, which was my dad, are going to be divorced. And then you're going to marry a man. And she gave the description of the man that became my stepdad years later. You say, well, now, how does that happen? Let me tell you how it happens. The moment my mom went to the fortune teller, to the psychic, she committed the sin of witchcraft. She opened the door to that. And then a demon came in and had legal right to go make the words of that psyche come to pass, meaning cause my mom and dad to divorce, bring my stepdad into the picture, who was an alcoholic for years upon years. I mean, the entire time they were married. And it brought that thing to pass. So listen, you can go to a fortune teller, a psychic, a medium, and they can tell you something, and then the demons can go there and have legal right to make it happen in your life. So just because it comes to pass doesn't mean it was from God, y'all. It's another thing you better get down in you. Just because a sign and wonder comes to pass that they give doesn't mean that it's from God. The devil can make stuff happen. I notice a lot of times these false prophets and these psychics and mediums, a lot of times it's always something bad. Oh, I see you're going to have a car wreck. Well, guess what? Then the demons follow you around, make somebody, you know, distract somebody or distract you and make you have a car accident. Ooh, those were for real. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of psychics and mediums and fortune tellers who call themselves Christians. Especially ones hollering about there's going to be a great wealth transfer. Oh, y'all want to? OK. Go ahead and play Mr. Barry. I don't even know how you're saying, what's up, Barry, what's up? I don't know what it is. 
Well, soup, I don't know. Huh? It does, his, it, the way it's spelled makes no sense if that's the way it's pronounced. But let's, let's start this off here. Make sure we back it up to begin and get the volume on. I want you all to hear this. And this guy's featured. He's featured on the Elijah list all the time. Somebody ought to change the name of that. The false prophet list. It's unreal. There's, there's absolutely no discernment. And this, but let's let's just listen to this. This is this very again. Where is it? Wunsk, Wunsk. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what he said. But go ahead. He's the new flavor of the month. That there are things in motion, in place. We've been talking about for a long time. The wealth transfer. You know, we literally know with the ones that are in touch with me. They've signed the documents globally. That this month there's a bank account with 96 decimal points to the left. We know that these things are signed off and they should be moving. Uh, and so why aren't they? And so we went in and uh, anyway we we dealt with that thing. Uh, and I'm expecting that we are going to see. I mean we are so close right now to to what is unfolding here. I, I believe that we're within leagues. Buenos dias, mis amigos. Welcome to my channel. Please support your local food bank. I like this guy, by the way. Rogan Alcohol Center. So today we're going to be looking at Barry Wunsch and his friends flying to heaven to look at the book of accusation, Satan's book in heaven. I've never heard that before. As well as the book of life. And also, we're going to be looking at the great wealth transfer. And he has confirmed 100%. Where's my thumbnail? The sex billion dollars, a great wealth transfer confer 96 decimal places to the left. I actually phoned my brother-in-law. He uh, did his PhD in Spain, multiple languages, and teaches physics and mathematics. I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. So let's listen to it one more time, and then we're going to get to his trip to heaven. No, okay, you can that. Stop. Now, in his trip to heaven, literally he says that, that he was allowed to open the book of life, and then that there's the book, the devil's book up there of accusations. Now, can I just go ahead and tell you, there's nowhere in the Bible that says there's a book of the devil in heaven of accusations. I'm going to tell you right now, this guy didn't go to heaven, right? But he's, he's prophesying basically that within weeks, and he lived, this was just a few days ago, this pro, he said within weeks, there's going to be this great wealth transfer, and every Christian is going to be a trillionaire over, times over. Do you know what the Bible says about people like this? Mm -hmm. See, here's the thing. If Christians knew, understood, and this is, this, this is another serious thing we'll get to this morning. If Christians understood the Bible and end-time prophecy, end-time prophecy says the exact opposite of this. The mark of the beast is economic sanctions against Christians. You will not be able to buy or sell. Unless you take the mark of the beast. You're going to have a trillion dollars in your bank account and then not be able to use it. Does that make sense? Let me tell you who's going to get it. I think some of these who are in with the Illuminati and the cabal, who are pretending to be Christians, they're going to get it and go, the rest of you just don't have enough faith. I think a lot of these, and listen, I found out some stuff. You know, the, the colonel, lieutenant colonel, sends me some interesting stuff. But he sent me some stuff, and they already have a classifications on you. And a lot of these people, a lot of people, ministers, Christians, famous people, rich people, are selling out to have what's called a sovereign status so that their bank accounts won't disappear. And maybe they might get the wealth transfer and become very extremely wealthy. Or it might be this universal basic income that they're going to give everybody as long as you submit to the mark of the beast, the implant, the chip. As long as you submit to universal surveillance and constant surveillance. As long as you make sure you won't buy a firearm maybe. Or you only buy the bugs to eat and not meat. You get know what I'm saying? Programmable money, controllable money. That's what the CBDCs are about. The central bank digital currencies. 
that are going to be pushed upon us within the next couple of years. It's the step to doing away with your cash so they can totally control you. It's the last step before they make you put the thing in your hand or your forehead. But if you're a true born again Christian and you know the Bible, you will not bow your knee to the beast and the beast system, to the Antichrist system. And you're not going to take this mark and you are going to be under economic sanction. You're not going to be part of the great wealth transfer. This is about the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. But I'm going to tell you, a lot of these so-called false prophets have sold out to the Illuminati, to the cabal. They have sold out for money and fame and numbers. And they're like, you know. And, and some of them have been just deceived enough to go, well, you know, your family will have a bunker. We'll take care of you because, you know, just, you know, it's about, it's not, it's just like, did anybody see the guy, the, the, the head of the Arizona RNC that went to Carrie Lake? Now, this is a Republican going to her and basically telling her, hey, some powerful people back east are willing to pay you pretty much whatever you want. You name your price to not run right now just wait two years I wonder why they just wanted to wait two years what do they got in store the next two years that it wouldn't matter if she ran in two years or not but basically making a deal with her and it's obvious because he but name your money name your amount you want a job with a major corporation just name it and this guy's supposed conservative Republican head of the Arizona had to resign because she made the recording public. What's wild is she, she threatened him, said, if you don't resign, I've got a worse recording I'm going to put out there. I can imagine what that was. And she said, oh, they're probably going to kill me if I don't take their offer. And he starts talking about the cartels. And I'm like, that's a weird subject to shift to. So basically, we'll have a cartel member kill you and, and we'll blame it on the cartel. And you won't even... You won't know it's us. This is, this is the games they're playing. Oh, and the NFL. Let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. The NFL is a complete, sold-out, Illuminati, cabal entity, and it's all scripted. The videos have come out now. There's too much evidence now. It's all scripted. So let me just say this. Anybody basing any prophecies off of who's in the Super Bowl? Who are they working for? Yeah, I'm about to show you. This is going to be disturbing. Now, <laughs> there's so much to do here. Um, before we get to the one that everybody, some people are going to get real upset. Let's, let's, let's break down. Let's go to Bob Jones. Now, Bob Jones died in 2014, but he was one of the most, how do I say it, prolific, most influential uh prophet within the charismatic Pentecostal church where he he is like the father of the International House of Prayer Bickles movement he's like the prophetic father he's he was the prophetic one of the prophetic fathers of, of Rick Joyner's movement Morning Star movement I mean this guy's been everywhere this guy this guy was around for three decades really in the ministry stuff probably some of the 70s so probably about four five decades now not Bob Jones University. This is not Bob Jones University. This is a guy, a prophet, charismatic prophet named Bob Jones. Now, let me, I'm going to read it to you. Y'all okay? I'm gonna, this is from my book, The Polluted Church, so I'm just going to read a little bit. That's all right? I got a whole chapter on Bob Jones. Let's see if we can do this here. Um, all right. Here we go. It's going to give you a little history here. It says, it was at Mike Bickle's ministry or the Kansas City Fellowship there uh, in 1983 that Bob Jones was given uh, first given a platform to share his strange prophetic gift and experiences. He claimed to have 10 to 12 visions a night and touted numerous out-of-body experiences. Obviously, he was able to operate in enough supernatural revelation like predicting a comet and snowfall in a month not known for snow to get Mike Bickle to accept him. But according to eyewitnesses at the time, there were many odd and unbiblical things going on with Jones as well. 
Then in the early 1990s, it was discovered that Jones had been having women come into his office and undress in order to receive a prophetic word from the Lord. And though they moved him behind the scenes for a season after his fall, Mike Bickle still calls Bob Jones the father of his entire IHOP International House of Prayer movement and admits, it says here he admits that Bob Jones has been the most integral prophet throughout the evolution in the ministry of Kansas City. And I have all the, the references documented here about this, all right? I said, now, Bob Jones has also served as chief mentor to many of the present-day prophets in the charismatic church world. As I stated previously, one of the more recent disciples is his former leader of the 2008 Lakeland Revival, Todd Bentley. Shortly after, Jones told Bentley how about a female angel named Emma that appears to him. She appeared in one of Bentley's meetings accompanied by strange manifestations. Now, there's no such thing as female angels appearing. Let's just get that straight right now. You don't see that in Scripture. But here is Bentley's account. This is Todd Bentley saying, Within a few weeks of, of Bob asking me about this angel named Emma, I was in a service in Beulah, North Dakota. In the middle of the service, I was in conversation with Ivan and another person. When in walks Emma. And as I stared at the angel with open eyes, the Lord said, Here's Emma. I'm not kidding. She floated a couple of inches off the floor. It was almost like Catherine Kuhlman in those old videos uh, when she wore a white dress and looked like she was gliding across the platform. Emma appeared beautiful and young, about 22 years old, but she was old at the same time. She seemed to carry the wisdom, virtue, and grace of a Proverbs 31 on her life. Now, this is so important, a spirit appearing in this me meeting to this guy to Todd Bentley. She glided into the room emitting brilliant light and colors. Emma carried these bags and began pulling gold out of them. Then as she walked up and down the aisles of the church, she began putting gold dust on people. God, what is happening? I asked. The Lord answered, she is releasing the gold, which is both uh, the revelation and the financial breakthrough that I'm bringing to this church. And here again, there's this, this big wealth breakthrough, this big wealth transfer coming to the church. I want you to prophesy uh, that Emma showed up in this uh, service the same time that the angel appeared in Kansas City as a sign that I am endorsing and releasing a prophetic spirit in the church. Y'all hear this crap? He goes on, within three weeks of that visitation, the church had given me the biggest offering I'd ever received to that point in my ministry. Thousands of dollars, thousands. Even, the, even though the entire community consisted of only 3,000 people, Weeks after I left the church, the pastor testified that the church offerings had either doubled or tripled. During this visitation, the pastor's wife, and it was an Assembly of God church, got totally whacked by the Holy Spirit and began running around the church barking like a dog and squawking like a chicken as a prophetic spirit came on her. I can tell you right now, that's not the Holy Spirit. Not even close, not even remotely close. Also, as this prophetic anointing came on her, she started getting phone numbers of complete strangers and calling them up on the telephone and prophesying over them. She would tell them that God gave her their telephone number and then would give them words of knowledge, complete strangers. Then angels started showing up in the church. I believe Emma released a financial and prophetic anointing on the place. Um, and it just goes on and on, but I want to get to something here. Later, when Todd Bentley told Bob Jones that Emma appeared to him, Bob said Emma was the angel that helped birth and start the whole prophetic movement in Kansas City in the 1980s. She is a mothering type angel that helped nurture the prophetic as it broke out. She didn't do such a good job at nurturing the prophetic because it was just one false prophecy after another, one sexual scandal after another, and they went deep into occult mysticism. It wasn't God. Not even close. Virtually, that means the entire prophetic movement from America has been polluted, contaminated, and demonic from the beginning. Since the 80s, when it really kicked off. Now, what's, what's interesting is, do a little research. And I found out that there is a Japanese Buddhist god called Emma-O. And that's their god of the underworld who lives in the yellow springs under the earth in a huge castle all covered with silver and gold. 
Todd Bentley said this Emma angel opened up a prophetic well in that church, and the demon god Emma O is said to live in springs under the earth. He also said that the Emma angel carried bags and began pulling gold out of them. And we see the demon Emma O associated with gold, silver, and precious jewels, things associated with financial prosperity. I said, this f female spirit entity is also connected with occult meditation and contemplation, which is something else that Todd Bentley, Bob Jones, Patricia King, and the rest of this gangle of demonic prophets claiming to be Christians lead people into. It's, it's insane. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. Let's see. It says right here. Listen to this. So, so back in the 1980s, there was a pastor in the Kansas City area named Eddie Gruen who was who had fellowshiped and ministered and operated within all of this and he knew everybody involved and he finally started seeing so much stuff that he wrote a document and brought it all out into the open and it was called the Doc documentation of aberrant practices and teachings of Kansas City fellowship by Pastor Ernie Gruen. Pastor Gruen wrote about Bob Jones teaching children to initiate out-of-body experiences in the 1980s at Kansas City Fellowship where Mike Bickle was a pastor. He wrote in his report, and I have it, I downloaded it. They are taught that out-of-body experiences are the norm. One mother described her son's experience with a friend from Kansas City Fellowship. My son, 11 years old, spent the night with his cousin who still goes to Kansas City Fellowship. Later, they all went upstairs and sat in a circle. Then the seven-year-old son of one of the Kansas City leaders uh, Kansas City Fellowship leaders told them that if they held hands, they could go into the third heaven and see angels and taste the tree of life. From a Christian counselor there, it is my belief that Dominion's uh, Kansas City Fellowship Christian School, their lackadaisical attitude about education is not conducive to a sound learning environment. To quote one child, I can go to the third heaven and get out of a test. More power to me. But this is the stuff I could, like I said, I could go on and on about this. But let's show. Just throw up Bob Jones, just show you his little sexual scandal thing. Now, this is very important that you understand this. Because many of these prophets claim Bob Jones to be either a former mentor, spiritual father. Well, not that one. The one, y'all can see that anyway. But put the one up about just Bob Jones real quick and Paul Cain. Yeah, just, well, no, no, no. The, the, the clip of his, the article clip of his sexual scandal, just so you'll see what I'm talking about. And this is going back to the late 80s, early 90s. Not Paul Kane, but Bob Jones. We'll come back to Paul Kane. There should be, yeah, there it is. So here is, uh, about Bob Jones and his thing. Now let's go. Let's just go ahead and put up Paul Kane. Paul Kane was another one, and this is important. I need to address this. You say, "Why are you addressing?" I don't know any of these people, and two of these are dead because the, it continues. And I'm going to show you where not only does their spirit, the demon spirit that was in them and working through them, continue, but even their false doctrines continue. So Paul Kane was another one. Paul Kane was a protege of uh, William Branham, and uh, and this was a a miracle prophetic guy back in the 50s and the 60s. And a lot of people still revere William Branham as, as a prophet, but I'm going to tell you he was operating something else. I'm just going to tell you that right now. I don't, I am not going to take time to get that. But Paul Kane was like his little boy protege. And I'm going to be honest with you. I believe something happened to Paul Kane when he was young. I believe in, in that mix that somebody molested him or some kind of sexual thing that went on. Because Paul Cain, pretty much for the rest of his life, struggled with alcoholism and homosexuality. But Paul Cain was one of these that would walk up to you and tell you your telephone number. Okay? And he would impress people like that. Foretold when earthquakes were going to happen. Right? And he got people, big people, like Mike Bickle, like John Wimber, who the founder and head of the Vineyard Churches. He got all them to believe and open the door to these things. Now... Paul Kane is the one who was at Kansas City as well and started teaching what was then called the Manifest Sons of God Doctrine. And what that means is they believe there's going to be a group of Christians that become super Christians, that become, uh, they, even, they even had a, a, Rick Joyner called them super apostles are going to come. And uh, then at, at Mike Bickle's ministry at Kansas City, they called them Joel's Army. 
And that basically these supernatural, invincible Christians are going to rise up. They're going to become so prophetic and so mature and so powerful and so anointed. They'll be calling down fire from heaven and doing all this stuff. And I'm just like, first of all, Joel's army has nothing to do with a human being. But, well, that's another story. But it's the same doctrine that gets kind of regurgitated. That some, and, and this is how what they do is they basically tell these young people, if you come to IHOP Kansas City and learn how to pray 24 hours a day and worship 24 hours a day and you submit to our teaching and to the, you become prophetic, you could, you're going to be one of these Joel's army. You're going to be one of these manifest sons of God. You're going to be one of these super apostles. You're going to be one of these, these super Christians in the last days. And it's flattery. And it plays on these people's desire to do something great for God. There's nothing wrong to have that desire to want to be, want God to use you and, and do great things to you. But you, there, there's a way to do it. And there's a way not to do it. You wait on God. And, and, and truly, the goal of a Christian is not to become some superman or super famous, powerful person. It's to just be humble and obey God and let him do whatever he wants. And he might make you famous in the ministry and in the kingdom, and he might not. It does, it's, that to me is irrelevant. Okay, But it's important you understand this because also because of that, most of these people do not have a correct end-time belief. They believe in what's called this manifest sons of God. This, they believe, it's called dominion theology. It's called kingdom now. It's called the seven mountain mandate. And basically what it is, is they don't believe that Jesus is coming back. They don't believe things are going to get worse and worse and worse in the world. They don't believe there's going to be an antichrist. They don't believe there's going to be a mark of the beast. They don't believe there's going to be a great persecution and it's going to look like the church is losing. They believe the church is going to become so anointed, so powerful that we're going to take over the government. We're going to take over the arts. We're going to take over media. We're going to take over the world and create this Christian utopia so Jesus can come back and we just hand it to him on a platter. Like we're going to do it all. And the Bible prophecy is the complete opposite of that. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. And I'm going to be dealing with that in the, in the days ahead, too, dealing with preterism and all this other stuff. Because a lot of them are preterists. They believe Jesus came in 70 A.D. And, and, and a lot of them believe we're living in the spiritual millennial reign where we are ruling and reigning in Christ. Do it, does it look like we're in charge of anything here? This is why they, 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 they come unglued and just get so giddy when it seems like a Christian gets into, into a political place of authority. Not that God won't have Christians get into political positions of authority or bless Christians to have like he did with Daniel or he did with Joseph and other things. But never are we, does it say we're going to take over the governments of the world, the media, the monetary. They actually say we're going to take over the seven mountains. We're going to take over the monetary system. We're going to take over it all. We're going to be the gazillionaires. This false doctrine about the end times and the second coming of Jesus and what surrounds it is literally what is helping them perpetuate and stay in their false doctrines. And it's leading others into error. You hear me? Now let's look, I want to show you, <laughs> we dealt with that. So let's go to, um, let's go to Joseph Z, the short one, first of all. This is the new flavor of the month here. I do not like this dude. And I don't care if he sees this. I don't like you, dude. I got to love you in Jesus, but I don't like you. Because you're a smooth, false prophet. But I want to show you the convoluted crap. In fact, let's play, let's play the long one first that starts at 953. Yeah. I want you to see, first of all, I want you to see, he, he's, this is just from like two days ago. And this is a guy that Pastor Greg Locke just had at his church. I wouldn't have him keep my dog. Because he'd probably start laying hands on my dog and prophesying over it and he'd be demon possessed when I got home. I'd have to cast demons out of my dog. Now, you say, Pastor Dean, you're terrible. I, I, I hate this stuff. I hate what they're doing. And it's, again, he's another one that's amassed just hundreds of thousands of followers. And, uh, but let's play this. I want to show you, because I want to give you an illustration of the convoluted nonsense 
that they're passing on for prophecy. Yeah, there he is. Now, let me, before, well, before you, you play it, just where you get to the spot, hold up. Bob Jones gave a prophecy either back in the 80s or the early 90s. Bob Jones gave this prophecy. He said when the, when the Kansas City Chiefs, because they were in Kansas City, when the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, then revival's breaking out and the super apostles are going to rise up. I kid you not. So the charismatic and Pentecostals who think Bob Jones is a prophet and who are just, you know, out of their minds giddy over when the Kansas City went to the Super Bowl in 2020. Oh, they're about to have a conniption. And then Kansas City wins. And guess what happens in 2020? Was it revival? Did y'all see any revival break out worldwide? No, did not. In fact, the opposite happened. Here's what's wild. He even admits, no, the opposite happened. But yet he's going, oh, it was just delay. It was just delay. So then, you know, the, the Kansas City Chiefs, they were in the Super Bowl again. I can't remember if it's 2021, 2022. Anyway, they're in it again this year, right? So here we go. And then, again, let me just add to this. I have watched for 30 years there be prophecies about something happening at the Super Bowl. Eventually, somebody's going to get it right. All right? <laughs> I'm so sick of it. Actually, while we're playing this, look up for me. Uh, Super Bowl scene from Some of All Fears. We'll play that in a second. Yes, we are. Um, but I want you to see, because again, the Illuminati, they mirror something. Now, he's going to talk about this Super Bowl Vegas vision he had or whatever dream he had. And then he refers to the Bob Jones prophecy about it. Then he talks about how in 2020, him and his friends were sitting in Canada and they were all, ooh, about Bob Jones. Maybe that's on the other clip, but you're going to see something. I want you to see, you, if you see what he's about to do on this whiteboard, you see somebody do this claiming to be a prophet, run, run away, because this is foolishness. And I'm going to tell you, the, the prophet Jeremiah said, I have seen folly in the prophets of Israel. And that means absolute foolishness. And this is what this is. Let's, let's listen. In Las Vegas, February 11, 2024, the Super Bowl happens here. If we could, I want to show the next clip also in just a moment because here's what's going on. We got a is, Super Bowl scenario going on. Let's show the next one where this gentleman's talking about the Super Bowl and announcing why it's okay. in Vegas. Watch this. Greetings. Welcome to the Death Star. Welcome to the Death where Star. Our opponent's dreams come to die. My father always said that the greatness of the Raiders is in its future. Well, today that future truly starts. This magnificent stadium was built on the backs of thousands of players, coaches, administrators, Vegas. and fans who for the past 60 years have proudly worn the silver and black. This is our field of dreams. This is our house. Fast forward to where the stadium's personality. Hold on, we, we had a little problem. We, we're trying to get to the where he goes to the whiteboard. I don't know what the problem is, but it looked it. it I downloaded these, I actually screen captured the, There we go, there we go, right there. That's perfect, right there. So we had a problem, it wouldn't download, so we're having to just try to find the spots. So go ahead, go ahead, sorry about that. Little little <clears throat> glitch First there. of all, this is the season where we're going into the Super Bowl, okay? We're going into the Super Bowl. It's Super Bowl 58, okay? Super Bowl 58, we're coming into it. Um, this is also, and you need to hear this word, it's a do over twenty twenty to twenty twenty four. It's a do over. It's a it's a do over we're seeing happen here. So what I sense at this, there's some pretty interesting things that I believe are going to begin to break loose. First of all, at the Super Bowl this year, it is a time where the Chiefs 
are once again going to face the 49ers. You know when the last time this happened? 2020. The last time this matchup happened was in 2020. The Chiefs faced the 49ers in 2020. And quite frankly, it's the third time the Chiefs have been in the Super Bowl in the last four years, I should say, since 2020. It's the third time they've been there since 2020. Okay, I'm getting to something. Now, please hang here. There's a prophetic unction I have on this. This is a do-over. There's things taking place with this. And when we're looking at this, I see a number of activities that are happening. Now, if you remember, there was a guy, a prophet named Bob Jones, and I don't put a lot of stock in some in, in different people, but uh, he did have a word, and a lot of people greatly respect this word, that he shared that when the Chiefs, and this is in the 80s, when the Chiefs win the Super Bowl, it would be the time for the apostolic chiefs to rise. Okay? That's what he saw, that they would rise. Now, there's more I want to get into at this. This is really important today. Now, um, as he's saying these things and he began to share this, uh, you realize something else, that the stadium that they're meeting in, in this, this season... Um, it's the Allegiant Stadium. Funny word to be aligned with the uh, Death Star. That's what they call it. They've actually named this place that. Now, if you're a Star Wars nerd, that has a lot of connotation to it. A lot of connotation to it. Interesting. You know, the, the significance of this word, you know, uh, even with you know, things I've understood, and then this. Very interesting. Um, when you're looking at that whole picture, this whole uh, uh, Death Star scenario with the Chiefs and the 49ers, there's something going on around this. Now, in the mix on all this, you have Taylor Swift. Okay, we can, st- we can just stop. <laughs> okay, now, let me just bring out something to you. This is, you want to know how I came across this guy? And we're going to get this short clip ready. I came across this guy because after the debate between me and Greg Locke, Pastor Greg Locke, Greg Locke shared a short video that this guy did basically slamming me about just the whole flat earth biblical cosmology issue saying, why are you, why are you getting off on other things? Blah, blah, blah. Why are you wasting time? We need to just be focused on the gospel. Does it, did you hear any gospel in this right here? He's focused on the Super Bowl and Taylor Swift and the Death Star and the Chiefs and Bob, some from prophecy from Bob Jones. And this goes on for an hour. And he talks about me needing to focus on the gospel. This is the cycle. But see, let me tell you something. I believe he's he I believe he may just be working for the other side. I'm just going to tell you right now. Oh, he just spent his time going off on the debate, going off on me, going off on flat earthers, biblical cosmology. If you believe the Bible about creation, you're wasting your time. But we get Taylor Swift and the Death Star and the Chiefs and the 49ers. Who gives a rat's monkey tail? That's a new one for y'all remembering Pastor Dean remarks there, right? Let's play the other clip. I can't even remember now. I, I did so many clips between last night and this morning. Let's, let's see if this is the one. This. Yeah. We're looking at this Chiefs winning, apostolic Chiefs rising word. And remember this. Now, in 2020, when the Chiefs won the first time with the Super Bowl, I remember I was in Canada. I was with some friends. We were out to eat, and we're sitting there watching this. And that prophecy, we were talking about that prophecy. That prophecy was being fulfilled. And when they won, everybody expected like worldwide revival. They expected Mm -hmm. something to break loose. But the very opposite happened. The opposite happened. The worldwide plague came. (laughs) You know, The difficulty came. Mm -hmm. But here's the kicker. In the middle of that worldwide issue, there was, in a sense, an uprising and a revival. There were things that took place, but I have a word about this. Mary, I have a word about it. Mm-hmm. I believe God is saying so clearly that what began to rise up was the opposition to God's destiny and plan. Mm-hmm. Delay, but not denial. Mm-hmm. 
Here's the word of the Lord I sense in this part of it. There's delay, but not denial. In other words, 2024 is not only a do-over for the negativity that's coming on the horizon. It's a do-over for the purpose of God to manifest in the world. And you see it through the Chiefs, the Super Bowl. And the only reason I'm so tied to this is because the Lord woke me up on September 16th, 2023. And when I was woken up, in a vision, I was in Las Vegas and I began to see people trapped in a room. I began to see these things. So I have something to share with this. I believe it's possible that either we're going to see breakthrough in the middle of a storm, as we've drawn on this board many times, or we're going to indeed see something heinous, nefarious, cyber, and terrible things happening right at that celebration. All right, let's Mm -hmm. stop right there. In February. Do you notice that this is the kind of false prophecy crap? Notice he said, we're either going to see a breakthrough, something great happen, or we're going to see something. If you're a prophet, be specific. (laughs) This is the kind, but people, for some reason, eat this crap up and have no discernment whatsoever. This is the same guy while he was at Pastor Greg Locke's church this past week, I think it was a week ago or two weeks ago, is up there saying, oh, we, you know, this, this minister, one of the ministers, we, we, he needs a plane. And he's the one going around, you need to give $1,000. You need Somebody in here needs to give 10000 Somebody needs to give 20000 Let me tell you something. If a so-called prophet is focused on money, they are in idolatry. If they're using their prophetic gifts, talents, abilities, in any way to manipulate money, to pressure money out of people, to get wealthy, they are Balaam's. You hear me? And Greg, I warned Greg about this when we were in South Carolina speaking at the same conference back in September. I said, you got false prophets and false people coming around you and and all around you, and you better stop. I actually told him, I said, you don't even need to read. I pointed at my uh, light clay under the seal book on creation. I said, you need to read this one, the prophetic. I said, not because I wrote it, because some of these people and some of the people that follow these people are around you. And you're letting them into your life and your church. It's time for some discernment. Y'all hear me? It's time to know these people. It doesn't take a lot of digging. I've listened to this guy just a few times. You know what he's prophesying? I saw him interviewed by a guy named Rick Renner. And I saw this interview and him talking about how, oh, America's going to be restored and everything's going to be wonderful. And we're going to go back to like it was in the 50s and how America was at its peak of prosperity and, and military power. Bleep, 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 bleep. None of that is what Bible prophecy tells us. None of that is what true prophets are telling us. True prophets are telling us we're headed for very rocky times that america is going to be judged the financial system is going to be collapsed i was walking through washington you want a prophetic word for me i was walking through washington dc in 2008 i was on the mall i lived in dc and i'm walking through the mall and i love the smithsonian i love history i love archaeology i love these things and i so i i love going to the smithsonian and I'm walking there, and I love the history of our country. I love my country. There's nothing wrong with loving your country. I love my country. We got many problems, but I love America. And I'm walking through there. And the Holy Spirit comes upon me, and he says, nothing will be left that's here. Everything you see will be gone. Washington, D.C. will be destroyed. There will be nothing left. San Francisco, the Lord told me, will be destroyed. Nothing left. Be completely destroyed. He has shown me the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States devastated with destruction. The Antichrist will come to power. The world government will come to power. The mark of the beast will come. In fact, in Revelation 13, 7, when it says about the mark of the beast, before, right before you get there, it says that the Antichrist and that beast world government will make war with the saints and prevail against them. And many of you, he said, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be killed for your faith. Do you think these prophets are preparing anybody for martyrdom? For the mark of the beast. They are going to give an account. 
And I'm not talking about arguing about what, when the timing of the rapture is, though that's an important issue now. But when you start talking about the church is going to take over the world, and I'm going to tell you, any pastor that starts believing it, you know what he wants after that? Money and power. Political power. Watch them. See, this is what I have. You know, somebody asked me to share the prophecy about Trump, and I'm going to share that, that God gave me in 2016. Oh, well, there's a lot of people that prophesied about Trump winning in 2016, but they missed it in 2020. But let me tell you what was different about the prophecy God gave me in 2016 about Trump. Very different prophecy than, yeah, Trump's going to win and America's going to be restored and the white hats are going to come in and every, all the bad people's going to Guantanamo Bay to prison. I mean, there are people still pushing this. And that's what not, not what the Holy Spirit said to me about Trump in 2016. In January of 2016, I said I was done with politics, wasn't even going to vote, sick of both sides, Republican and Democrats, all corrupt. Most of them bought and paid for by the satanic, Luciferian, Illuminati cabal. I said I'm not even going to get involved. And I'm praying, um, it was a Saturday night, praying, get ready for church the next morning. This is in early January or mid-January, I can't remember, I'd have to look it up. But I know it was in January 2016, before the primaries began. Remember how we just had the first Iowa caucus in January? So it was right before the Iowa caucus, and I get down on my knees to pray about the Sunday morning. The next day, I wasn't praying about Trump. I wasn't praying about the presidency. I, I was like, American politics is over. It's, we're done. And the Holy Spirit comes all over me to the point I'm in tears running down my face. And this is what the Lord says to me. He said to me, my hand is upon Trump and it is my will for him to be president of the United States. He said, but it will not happen if my people do not pray for him and vote for him. And two, meaning you were going to have to discern it because the Christian candidate at the time, everybody wanted either Ted Cruz or Ben Carson. It was like, whoa, the Christians were all about that. So when I came out and said, no, God said he put his hand on Trump, they thought it was crazy. A lot of Christians is like, you're crazy. I'm going to tell you, when you, you go with what God says, not what people, people's opinion. Right? So the Lord tells me, he said, my hand, I put my hand upon Trump. Doesn't mean he was a perfect person. Doesn't even mean he was a Christian. The Lord just was like, I have chosen him for a purpose to do something like he did Cyrus, like he did Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't have to be a Christian. He doesn't have to be a godly man. He doesn't have to be a perfect man. God just said, I chose him. I put my hand upon him and it is my will for him to be president. And I said this. Before the primary started. And the Lord said to me, though, here's what he said. He said, I will turn his heart toward me. Meaning, he's not for me right now. Trump wasn't saved, and I don't know if he is now. I will tell you that his heart's more turned toward Christian things than it was before, and he knows more now than he did then. But does he understand Bible prophecy? No, because he's got all these kingdom now, dominion, seven mountain people around him, giving him a false understanding of the future. And this is why he missed it on the vaccine and some other issues, and this is why he had people around him he should have never had around him, like General Flint, like Pence. Everybody, y'all think Pence is a Christian. Pence is cabal. And I said that about Pence. I said Pence will betray Trump years before it happened. All right. But the Lord told me, he said, I will turn his heart toward me. And the Lord said these words to me. He said, it will be better for you if he is president. Now, does anybody doubt that it was better when Trump was president than if we had had Hillary Clinton? And then the Lord said, it will be better for you in tribulation. Now, I don't know if the Lord was saying that that was the seven year tribulation or just in while you are going through a season of trouble. OK. But none of that was Trump is coming. I don't believe that Trump is a savior and that he's somehow going to save America from what is coming. That cannot be stopped, will not be stopped. Even if Trump becomes president again in 2024, he will not be able to stop what is coming. Now, the Lord told me and the Lord, the people as Pastor Troy was here before the 2020 election, when all these prophets were saying Trump's winning. 
I could give you, I could play a list of them. They say, all said Trump's going to win in a landslide. He's going to be Trump. Some, one of, some of them said he's going to be a president for consecutive eight years. This is why when he lost, many of them were like, he's still the president, just behind the scenes, blah, 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 and all this nonsense. Look, if Trump's still president, then he just let the country go to crap in four years. Now, hear what I'm about to tell you. 2020, Pastor Troy sitting here right before church one morning. He says, Pastor Dean, you got it right in 2016. What do you feel in your spirit about 2020? Will Trump win? I said, no. I don't feel like he's going to win. And yes, I know he was cheated in states, and I know that. But again... I don't care whether he's cheated. He got put out of office and another guy got put in office. He lost the presidency. And anybody that believes he didn't, you're just delusional. Okay? But here's the thing. I told Troy that morning, I said, I believe we're going to need him worse as a nation and the world will need him worse in the position of presidents from 2024. Four to 2028. 20, now, let me say this. I wasn't saying it. I don't know. I don't know. God has not given me a word of whether Trump's going to actually overcome all the, the, the cheating and the election fraud and everything else. But I do know from what the Lord told me in 2016 that it will be better for us if he's president, even during the season when things are falling apart. It will be better. It's not going to stop these things, but it will be better for us. So I hope he wins. Do I know if he's going to win this time or not? No, because the Lord has not told me whether he's going to become president or not. So you know what? I don't say he is because I don't know. Right? I don't go to somebody, teach me how to prophesy. I need, to, I need a 2024 word. It's insane. Now, a lot of people think that because God put his hand on him and because God put him in office, they're saying, oh, no, Trump's part of the cabal. He's a Freemason. He's this. He's that. He's the one that gave us the vaccine. No, Trump is the one, if you'll remember, that told us about hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and azithromycin. Now, I think Trump went along with the vaccine because he knew if he didn't, half the country wouldn't vote for him. Because most people still believe the vaccine was a good thing. It saved us. They're still ignorant about what's really going on with it. So I think Trump was making a calculated, they're going to do it anyway. The NIH is going to do it. They're going to go this direction. The rest of the world's going to go this direction. If I say no and a bunch of pe more people die, then it's going to be on me. So I think he gave you option. Now, granted, I think the biggest, the biggest mistake he made was allowing them to push the vaccine and not fight it more. That was the, one of the biggest mistakes he made. But nobody said, nobody prophesied, nor did I, that he would not become president and make some mistakes. And let me tell you, if you were president of the United States, you'd make some too. I can't imagine trying to do that job. But now, here again, I don't care at this point who becomes president. Thing, the ship is going down. Okay? I don't care who's at the helm now. It's going down. Now, a good captain is going to be able to handle the situation better than a bad captain. You get what I'm saying? Now, let me tell you about another prophecy about this, and this is what was interesting. I'm, I'm believing that this prophecy is about Trump finally getting a true understanding of end-time Bible prophecy and where we're headed. And I want to tell you, and I don't know if I shared this or not. Did I share this? I think I shared it in, in Birmingham at our Bible study. But in 2019, was it December 2019? Faith was nine years old. Now, the Lord told me when Faith, even before she was born, that God was going to begin to use her in prophetic gifts and dreams. He told me about that. And so she had several. She's had some when she was like five that were just, four and five that were just dead on. But she had this dream, and she said, Dad, she said, uh, Trump was, had an RV. And she said, you and me and mom are going to go meet with, with President Trump and Melania in their RV. And she said, I was so excited, she said, when you got there, because they were going to go in the back with Melania and have their little tea and cookies thing. 
And that me and Trump, she said, we're going to go into another part and we went in another part to talk. And she said, and one, it's interesting because she doesn't even know this stuff as a nine year old. She said that Trump's secret, secret service team was much smaller than what normally she had seen. We've seen Trump's secret service team up close and personal. Okay. She said it was much smaller. And I knew, I knew when she was telling me this, she said, you and Trump went off the top. Well, I've known, I've always said, if I ever got a moment with him, I would explain to him what's really going to happen and how he needs to prepare that, how he needs to lead. Now, even if he's not president, he's still an influential leader. You understand? And he can still help people go in the right direction. Now, what's interesting about this dream was it was about, a week or two later, and this is what got my attention, is why I never forgot this dream she, she told me. Because about a week or two later, Trump is given a press conference, and he was live. I'm watching it on live TV. And out of the room, it's not, it has nothing to do with RVs or vacation. He's talking about some, something going on in the world or whatever. And then he just stops all of a sudden, and he says, you know what? I think me and Melania need to get us one of those RVs and go on a vacation. And I was like, what did he just say? An RV? I, that was the most random thing that's ever come out of his mouth during a RV. And then I realized, I realized that the RV in the dream represented that he was going to go. This is when he was still in office and everybody thought he was going to win in 2020. He was going to be on a vacation away from the office with a smaller secret service detail than he had would be have in office, but I'm hoping whether it's me or somebody else gets across to him, he gets away from Paula White and the rest of these false prophets that are telling him everything's going to be great and we're going to take over the world and make a utopia again. I pray that we will get to that point where he can get the truth so he will understand what he needs to do and especially if he happens to win by a miracle of God and become president again, it's, he's going to need Jesus. You know, they say that Abraham Lincoln, you know, though he said he was a Christian, was not until it was in the middle of the war. And he realized he was he was just so burdened and overwhelmed by everything that was going on that he finally fell on his knees. And this is from one of his best friends wrote about this. Said he fell on his knees and, and really gave his life to Jesus and started having Bible studies at the, at the White House. Praying for our country to survive. See, God didn't stop the Civil War. And you know what? We may have another one here in America. We may have a President Biden continue and these red states pull out and may Trump president of the red states. It could be that way. I mean, I, I, I don't know, thus saith the Lord, that we will divide and become two countries like we were during the Civil War. I don't say, I'm not saying thus saith the Lord, but I'm saying it could happen. If it happened in history before, it can happen again. And if they kill Trump, if they assassinate him, the country will divide right down the middle. They know that. They still want him out of the way. Look, the World Economic Forum wants him out. They don't want Trump at all. Trump just stated publicly he will not allow a CBDC in America. Now, hopefully that's not just a campaign speech. But he said it was because Vivek made him promise that he would deal with that and confront that issue. And he said, he told him, he said, you know, that is a good idea. We need to stop that. So we'll see. But Trump did keep his promises before. That's one thing we can know about. Now, again, whether Trump's president or not, whether we get a godly president or not, we have to decide how we're going to live and what we're going to do and how we're going to go through this stuff. And this is why I keep preaching this. The mark is coming, y'all. I spent hours the other day just going through all the financial stuff and i'm telling you europe europe will have it before we do they're this close and they're telling everybody you will not use cash 
India is, uh, is, is way past us. China has already implemented. Switzerland, the Bank of International Settlements, you never heard of that entity. Look it up. From the 1930s, it's been their plan. Yep, Unicoin. It's coming. It's all coming. And I'm not going to sell out, bow my knee to this system. I'm not going to do it. You hear me? We're going to go to one more passage. And guess what? It's still early. That was just the introduction. <laughs> Let's go to Jeremiah 23. Well, I've said this. I'll give, uh, somebody asked if you didn't hear that on the mic. Somebody said, well, what do, you th what do you say we do to prepare? And this is what I've been saying for actually for years now, probably since about 2010. I've said, number one, you need to pray like you've never prayed before and get close to Jesus. You get the sin out of your life. You need to fast. You need to get to the place where you, that's why I've been teaching on this again in this series. You need to learn to hear the voice of God and be sensitive to his leading, the Holy Spirit leading you. But in the, in the natural sense, I would say, people, you need, you need extra food, pro preferably long-term storage of food that will stay good for long periods of time. You need to understand you may be without electricity for months at a time. That could happen. Generators, solar lights, a way to heat your home that doesn't take electricity. Um... A way to filter water is going to be vitally important. I shared this a week or two ago about one of the things that we have life straws and family life straws. One, one personal life straw that's about this big will filter over 260 gallons of water. I mean, filter everything out of it. A family life straw is about 10,000 plus gallons of water. You get two or three of those, you're good for ye several years. They're not, these are things that are not that expensive to do. If you can, if you have money in the bank, you have assets, I would be turning some of those assets, financial assets, into silver and gold that you have in your hand. Because there will be a season that you will be able to, uh, to use silver and gold. There will be a point that it says the rich man and everybody's going to throw their silver and gold in the streets. There will be a point you, you won't even be able to use that. I'm trying to convince our state leaders to make gold and silver legal tender so we can go to the store with real gold, real silver, or these things called gold backs and buy stuff. And some states have already done it. Like I said last week, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, New Hampshire, and there's other states coming into it. I don't know why Alabama's always lagging behind here. Huh. But those are some practical things that you can do to be ready. I mean, you have to, I, I say, look at it this way. What would you do? Think about it this way. What would you do if you could not go to the store for two or three months? You better have, here's a, here's a thought, toilet paper. Another thought people don't think about, how important it is, soap. Something that can kill germs and bacteria and things. First aid kit. You know, I've sewed up, I cut my hand real bad one time and couldn't go to the emergency room and sewed myself up without painkillers. You don't have to be tough. You might have to sew yourself up or get somebody to sew you up. You know what I'm saying? You got to think ahead. Some of you that are dependent on certain medicine, you better get some extra. And then it, at some point, you better start believing God to heal you because there'll be a point you won't be able to get it. China, China basically controls 90% of our antibiotics. We don't even make, do y'all know that, that the United States does not have an antibiotics factory in America? We do not manufacture it. George W. Bush ended those. The Bush satanic cabal ended that. So all of, all of our pharmaceuticals, when it comes to antibiotics, come from either India or from China, but mostly from China. So what if we go to war with China and they cut it off? Let me tell you, they said within two months we will be in a crisis 
because people in the hospital that need antibiotics to fight off infections are going to start dying. Remember, the war that's coming, the war that's coming, the sixth trumpet war I talked about last week, Revelation 9, says it will kill one third of mankind. So you better see this is what I'm talking. Do you hear these prophets talking about this stuff? They don't talk about what's in the word, what's actually in the word that's going to happen like that. The mark. World War Three, the Sixth Trumpet War, they don't talk about. Any of that, it's all you're going to prosper, there's going to be a great wealth transfer. We, you need to give till it hurts so I can have an airplane. You hear a minister talking about getting an airplane? Lord. Day's coming, you won't even be allowed to get in one. To go anywhere. Unless you have the, the mark or the, <laughs> the new one that'll be coming. Let's look at this. Oh. I'm going to start at verse nine. I'm not going to, I could read the first part, but I want to focus on the prophets because he talks about the pastors that scatter his sheep. And then he said, I'm going to set up some true pastors. But then he talks, starts talking about the prophets, the prophetic. And he says this, he said, my heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man, like a man whom wine hath overcome because of the Lord and because of the words of his holiness. He said, for the land is full of adulterers. For because of swearing, the land mourneth. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up. And then he says, their course is evil and their force is not right. He said, for both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Where? In the world or in my house? I have found their wickedness. Wherefore, their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein, and I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And I have seen folly, foolishness in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal. They caused my people, Israel, to err. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies, and they strengthen also the hand of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Now this is what he's talking about, the prophets that the people of God were following and listening to and loving. These were the prophets that were saying, you know, Jeremiah was saying Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in here and destroy this city and take all of you captive, and the ones that don't get taken captive are going to be killed. By the sword and by the famine and by pestilence. And the false prophets would stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, this shall not be. Nebuchadnezzar will not come in here. They would prophesy the exact opposite of Jeremiah. Who was right? Listen, he goes on. Let's keep reading. He says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Concerning the prophets, behold, I will feed them with wormwood, that's with bitterness, and make them drink the water of gall. And wormwood is also, I'll tell you this, it's a reference to the word is Chernobyl in Ukrainian and Russian. So it could be very well talking about radiation here as well. That's a whole other story. But I will feed them with wormwood and I will make them drink the water of gall. Why? For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Profaneness is, if you look that word up, it means spiritual uncleanness, pollution. That's why, this is why I named this book The Polluted Church from Rome to Kansas City. This pollution has gone forth from these prophetic ministries to the whole land, to America, to Europe, to Africa. What I hate seeing is, is, is African, like when I was in Nigeria, African preachers had, that had learned from these false prophets and mimicking them. I was like, Lord, we have spread this crap everywhere. That whole false prosperity nonsense. Let's keep reading. Verse 16, for the, he says, thus saith the Lord of hosts, hearken not. So he tells it. So what I'm doing today is tell you, quit listening to these people. And this is what Jeremiah says. 
that the Lord spoke to him, said, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesied to you. They make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. Do you hear that? Stop listening to them. What they're saying comes out of their own heart and mind. It's not from God. And then he says, they say still unto them that despise me. So he's saying, he said, they talk to people that are not, they hate me. You know, God said, if you're a friend of the world, you're the enemy of God, right? If you live a compromised, lukewarm life, if you are just indulging your sin and your idolatry and you just are sitting at ease in Zion, he says, you know what? You're my enemy. You're an enemy of God. And he says to those, he said, they, these prophets say to those who despise me, they basically hate the true ways of God. The Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. So they probably, oh, they walk in people that just really that live in sin, walk in compromise. You're going to have peace. That's why they start. I saw, I saw a woman, one of the clips, prophesying over a lady who was, who, who was uh, pregnant because she has been in fornication. Oh, the Lord's forgiven you. You don't know if the Lord's forgiven that lady. If she hadn't repented of her sin and asked for God's forgiveness and said, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. But you, people just walk up and start giving prophetic words out. But he said, the, they say, uh, they say still to them that despise me, the Lord has said, you shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, that no evil shall come upon you. So people who are doing things their own way, no evil shall come upon you. This is this is the kind of prophecies they get. Everything's going to be wonderful, right? Here's what the Lord says, though. The Lord asked this question, verse 18. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who has marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind, and it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he has performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will consider this perfectly. He even specifies in the last days, in the end time, he was talking, and this was, this is 26, 2700 years ago. He said, in the last days, you're going to understand this perfectly. You're going to consider this, these false prophets. He says, it's the Lord is angry over this. He said, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had actually you know, stood in my counsel, he said, and caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from their the evil of their doings. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophets said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. Now he's, then he says, though, but don't throw out the gift of prophecy. Don't throw out prophetic dreams or vision. There's true. He says, he says, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell it. And he that hath my word... Let him speak my word faithfully, for what is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. And boy, do they do this. One starts prophesying about the great wealth transfer, and before you know it, they're all talking about it. One has a... a, a, a trip to heaven and the next one you know they had a trip to heaven because you know what we got to have those followers and likes because we because that means cha-ching he said they steal my words everyone from his neighbor behold i am against the prophet saith the lord that use their tongues and say he saith Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and, call, uh, and cause my people to err by their lies and their lightness. That means their frivolous lifestyle and behavior. 
He said, yet I set them not nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all. Y'all see that? And then the Lord talks about how he's going to judge. Now, I want you to, he's going to judge that. And this whole false prophet group out here. In fact, put up, put up, I forgot the picture of Lance Wall now. I want to show you something. Lance Wall now in his book. I met him. I met him in Missouri. And I know there's a bunch of people that just love him, think he's like the best thing since sliced bread. He is not. Moldy bread, maybe. When I got up close to him and met him, it was like a darkness I sensed. I'm, gonna, I'm being honest. I'm telling you, what I sensed in the spirit was not the Holy Spirit. But this is the guy pushing the seven mountain mandate. This is the guy who was all big about prophesying and the prophecies about Trump being president. And everybody just thinks he's, oh, yeah, this is a marketing genius is what he is. And he really is because his real field of expertise is business and marketing, not ministry he'll tell you that put his book up here i want to show you something lance wall now who who wrote this with him bill johnson birds of a feather flock together now bill's out there in la la land his associate pastor chris volton same way prophesying chris volton's a preterist prophesying china's going to be the best country in the world China's going to prosper so much they're going to start giving to the world. China's going to save the world. I'm, I'm no kidding. I heard this prophecy myself years ago. I thought, what in the world is this guy listening to? Because it's not the word of God. It's not the Holy Spirit. Invading Babylon, the seven mountain mandate with contributions from, and I don't know who this Alan Vincent is, but C. Peter Wagner, another end time heretic. He was a, he was a, Professor at Florida Theological Seminary had a lot of good teaching on spiritual warfare, but his end time philosophy, he, he would laugh. Anybody talked about the second coming of Jesus or end time Bible prophecy or the mark of the beast, he thought all that was nonsense. It wasn't, wasn't going to happen. So he was in terrible error. He's dead now. Shay on, I won't even get into him. He was there with Todd Bentley saying Todd Bentley is going to be the next big revivalist while Todd Bentley's cheating on his wife and then divorces her, who is partially crippled, and leave the kids with her while he runs off with the secretary. But they're prophesying over Todd Bentley how he's going to be the next apostle of revival. When I saw I saw them doing that in Lakeland in 2008, all these same people, Rick Joyner, Bill Johnson, all of them prophesying over Todd Bentley. And I saw Paul Kane and Bob Jones and I saw the whole usual suspects. I said, this is going to be bad. And I'm t I kid you not, it was one month later. It all gets exposed that Todd Bentley, while the revival's going on, is cheating on his wife with his secretary. And not one of the prophets there discerned that he was in adultery. So what are they? Bill Johnson? I don't care. I'm, I, I told you I was going to name names today. Not one of them heard the voice of God. But they, how great the revival is going to be. How the miracles are going to be. How Todd Bentley's God's man. And he's laying on the floor shaking. Arr, arr. Yeah, right. That's Kundalini demon. And Patricia King. Oh, Lord, have mercy. The Jezebel prophet is herself. It was Patricia King and Bob Jones and Todd Bentley that were together. I have the video where they're talking about visiting the third heaven at will. And all, all Bob Jones said, well, if I lay hands on you, you know, I'll take you by the hand. We can go up there right now. It was all of this stuff. These, these, this is the woman who's like, she, she's in a service doing her head like that. <laughs> saying, power demons, power demons. Or no, what would she say? Power Power eagles, power eagles, power eagles. I'm like, you mean power demons, right? You mean power demons. Todd Bentley's wife's doing the same thing, shaking her head. And then come about pink elephants in the room. I kid you not, at a Morning Star event. Pink elephants. And, and people, ooh, that's, ooh. No. Forrest Gump said, stupid is, as stupid does. I mean, it's almost like the demons and these and these infiltrators put out as, as the most stupid and ridiculous stuff as possible and just go, I, I just got to see how many is going to believe this. And some of them are just deceived, but some of them know what they're doing. And some of them are witches and Satanists. They always infiltrate church. I wanted you to see this, though. I'm telling you. 
Y'all keep following these people. It's on you. After this, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna show. Let's put up the Rick Joyner thing. Let me put up with Rick Joyner. I'm just, oh, Rick Joyner. I read his book. I met him. I've met Bob Jones. I, I made the mistake in my twenties of letting Bob Jones lay hands on me, and I got all kind of demons of lust that I had to cast out of myself. I got totally contaminated and polluted by submitting to his, going to a service and letting him pray for me. So I've witnessed it personally. Same thing with Rick Joyner. I went to their conference in 2001, November 2001. Talked to him face to face. So nobody tell me, oh, you're just, you ain't talked to any of them. Oh, yes, I have. 2005, and this will tell you all you need to know. Rick Joyner uh, became part of the Knights of Malta. He was initiated, inducted into the Knights of Malta. The Knights of Malta is a secret society organization completely loyal to, dedicated to the Pope. It is a Roman Catholic military arm dedicated to war against the Protestant church. So Rick Joyner, and I'll tell you who else is who else is in that same Knights of Malta group with him is General Boykin, who was the general of our Delta Force. Another thing they all have in common, a lot of them are Roman Catholic. A lot of them are in the CIA. A lot of them are special forces. Oh, we're so we're so screwed. But that's why you better have Jesus, right? He's he's our refuge, he's our high tower, is is uh, you better be in Jesus. But here, here, this ought to let you, anybody that says what, what I'm about to read to you, Rick Joyner said, and I got to cover all this in detail in the book. This is from the Elijah list. Like I said, it should could be called the, the false prophecy list. And it says here, Rick Joyner on the Pope's passing. This is about Pope John Paul II. Called him one of the most remarkable leaders of our time. Steve Schultz, April 6, 2005. Let's go to the next one. Let's just read a little bit of this. So, Steve Schultz says, one of the more discerning voices in the church today is Rick Joyner. <laughs> that is the biggest joke I ever heard in my life. Like Rick, none of us get it right all the time. Uh, but let, us, uh, let me state that Rick gets it right a lot. No, he gets it wrong a lot. I've rarely seen such agreement as the agreement among the streams from Baptist to Pentecostal that this last pope was truly a godly man who led his flock to Jesus. No, we don't agree with every stand this Pope took, but we agree that God used him mightily. Let's keep going. So here's what Rick said at the passing, Rick Joyner, the prophet, right? Said at the passing of Pope John Paul II. Uh, the passing of Pope John Paul II is a major event because we have all lost one of the most remarkable leaders of our time. I am not a papist and do not believe that any man on earth should be called the head of the church which is the rightful place of Christ alone. However, I do not doubt that John Paul II was a man of God that all Christians should be thankful for and should rightly mourn. It was not his title, but his character that caused him to transcend the Roman Catholic Church and become a leader who blessed and advanced the whole church and indeed the cause of Christianity itself. He is one of the greatest leaders of our time and will be sorely missed. Now, I'm not going to keep, there's more to this I could put up here. here here's what I want to tell you about about Pope John Paul II. Pope John Paul II brought all religions together and said this. He said, all religions lead to God no matter whether you accept Jesus or not. Now, he said this on multiple occasions. Furthermore, you remember when the assassination attempt happened on Pope John Paul? He was shot, remember? The Muslim guy shot him, and he survived, but he was kind of touch and go there for a bit. He credited... For his recovery, did he credit Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, God Almighty in the flesh? No, he credited Mary for saving him and was one of the, mo the biggest pushers of the worship of Mary idolatry that ever existed in the Roman Catholic Church. To the point that, and you can fact check me on this if you want to, but to the point that, you know, up until 1994, the, 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 when the new Roman Catholic Catechism came out in, in 94, uh, Joseph, po, uh, I guess he was Cardinal Ratzinger at the time, who is now, who became Pope Benedict, he and John Paul II got together and changed the Roman Catholic Catechism and stated in the Roman Catholic Catechism 
that if you were Muslim, you were part of the Abrahamic faith, and you were part of the salvation, part of salvation, whether you acknowledge Jesus or not. Now, now, now folks, there's not a more antichrist religion on the earth than Islam that says that Jesus did not die on the cross, that he was not God in the flesh, and that he is really a secondary prophet to Muhammad. That's antichrist, okay? To say that as Pope over the whole Roman Catholic billion followers and to the world, to all those, to all those Muslims who need to come out of that false religion and accept Jesus Christ as God Almighty in the flesh as their Lord and Savior and be saved, he just told them that they don't have to do anything. They can stay Muslim. And I have this in slides and messages. And I can't remember the number in the catechism. What was it? Do you remember, Kelsey? Eight something. Eight oh seven or four or one. I can't remember. But I actually was in a Roman Catholic house down the road here. A, a, a person I went to high school with. A couple, actually, I grew up with, went to high school with. And we were doing some work in their house back when I worked for the GTR. And she was Roman Catholic, and I told her this. Now, this is the difference to tell you the Roman Catholic people. There are precious Roman Catholic people that love the Lord but and don't even realize what their church is doing because they don't really pay attention. But when I told her what Pope John Paul II did in changing the catechism and Ratzinger, she didn't believe me. But I noticed that on her mantle, uh, right above her fireplace, where her TV's right there, and these, these books, and it was the Roman Catholic Catechism, 1994. I said, oh, flip to it. Here it is. Now, she was in such shock. She sat there and read that for herself. She, and she looked up at me. She said, why did they do this? Looking back, why did they do this? I said, do you want the truth or do you want me to lie to you? Now, even though I showed her, she got so mad at me for just showing her what was in her own book that she tried to get me fired. Instead of admitting that her church leadership is leading people away from the Bible, away from Jesus, and for anybody, for Rick Joyner to make such statements about Pope John Paul II, I mean, I could spend a lot of time on all the stuff that Pope John Paul II did that was wrong. To say he was one of the greatest leaders of our time. To say that he was a man of God. That was leading, that leads millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people to worship Mary, which is idolatry. Either you are as ignorant as a rock, or you know what you're doing. And being part of the Knights of Malta, a Roman Catholic military order, lets me know that he was a plant from day one to penetrate the charismatic Pentecostal Protestant church world. Why are we surprised? The Jesuits swore in the 1500s they would infiltrate every, every Protestant seminary, Bible school, and church to destroy the Protestant church. They had, their mission has never changed. And they most of them pretend to be Protestant Christians while they're doing it. While they are, see, see, the, the Knights of Malta are bow their knee and kiss the ring of the black pope. And they ain't talking about skin color. Evil. The Vatican is an evil organization. You see anybody kissing the Vatican ring like Kenneth Copeland? You, you're following a deceiver. You hear me? Or you're following somebody so stupid and illiterate of Scripture that they're leading you in the wrong direction in their ignorance. Because either they're that ignorant or they're part of it. And I'm going to be honest with you. I have believed that Kenneth Copeland has been part of the other side since the 80s, the first time I saw it. So, get mad at me unsubscribe I don't care it's the truth and I didn't even name not even we didn't even get to an eighth of them but I hope I gave you some things to to 
recognize when you start seeing this so you will know who the pro true prophets are and who the false ones are. It's that serious. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's not a true prophet that's in the Roman Catholic Church. That's it. That if they're a priest, a bishop, a cardinal, a pope. Mm -mm. Because if they're following God, they're following the Holy Spirit, they will get out of that system of idolatry. Mystery Babylon, they will come out of her. So, Pastor Dean, now you didn't hurt my feelings because I'm Roman Catholic or I grew up Roman Catholic. Where does it say in the Bible to be Roman Catholic or Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian? It doesn't say any of those things. It says follow Jesus. You follow Jesus by following the word of God and following the Holy Spirit. And if you get off from the word of God, you're not following the Holy Spirit. Period. I don't care. I don't care how big the church is. I don't care how big and famous and how much money they have. I don't care how many followers or subscribers. I don't care. They get off away from this book and lead people away from it into error and idolatry and sin. It is the depths of Satan in our midst. But you can know it. If you seek God, you will know. You will have the Holy Spirit showing you. And, and, and you know what? It doesn't always, you don't always have to know all the details. So just like, I remember the first time I saw Kenneth Copeland on TV years ago, immediately in my spirit, the Lord said, no. I knew. And his wife's worse than him. I couldn't even stand to hear her talk for five seconds. And that's in the spirit. And I have no problem with women speaking. So it had nothing to do with that. Discernment. Holy Ghost discernment. And just knowing the word of God. You hear me? If a prophet is not warning you about what's really about to happen. And how bad things are going to get. And to prepare yourself. They are leading you astray. If they start talking about how America is going to be restored to her former greatness, they are lying to you. They're talking about a great wealth transfer and you're going to be rich. The only way you're going to be rich is to move to the other side. The Luciferian satanic side. They'll be glad to give it to you. Satan's always been willing to give fame and money and power to those who will bow to him. And he don't care how you bow. It's you, you bow to Satan, whether you bow to a statue of Mary or you go sell your soul and write your in blood on a piece of paper and say, I sell my soul to the devil for fame or power or position or whatever. I guess I preach long enough. Some people say, Pastor, Dean, you sound you sound mad about this. Yes, I am. I don't like false prophets. I don't like false teachers. You know what he says in 2 Peter? It said they make merchandise of you. You're just merchandise to them. You're a way to make money. Quit propping them up. Quit propping them up. See, that's what, another reason. We, we live in such a screwed up society now with, with the church world, with the, the whole obsession it, with ministries about money. That's why I don't take up an offering on Sunday morning. That's why I don't talk about it. You know what I do? I trust God. I trust God. And you know what? I learned a lesson a long time ago. Don't buy what you can't afford. Right? I know churches that built in the 80s, late 80s and early 90s, that went out, they, they had... 200 people, and they went and built a $20 million building that would seat, you know, 5,000 people. They didn't need that. And that money was not, most of it was the bank's money. And then they made people, I saw churches squeezing people for every dime they had, just like they held them up by their feet, shaking the money out of them. And do bond issues to build churches, and then the people they gave the money to for the bond issue run off with the money, and they never got their building. I've seen it all, man. I've seen all this stuff. I'd rather meet out in the rain than the banksters to own my building. You understand? 
All right, I guess I preached long enough. Let's stand. We don't do 30-minute sermonettes for Christianettes around here. <laughs> if I preached for only 30 minutes, folks would think that somebody, they killed me and it was a clone. <laughs> like, what have you done with Pastor Dean? This is not him. I can't do it. You know why? Hey, look, I get y'all pretty much, most of you, only one day a week. Sorry, but I got to get a lot into you in that one little meeting. All right. And guess what? Most college classes that I ever attended were down and a half, two hours long, right? So you're in school. Whether you're in our ministry school or not, you're in school. Because we, uh, we, you know, the days are coming. We may not get to meet like this. We may be running from house to house and riding bicycles and trying to avoid the drones. Y'all think I'm joking about that, but there's been some prophetic visions and dreams about trying to, in fact, there's been some about when we get into that time, me, somebody, another person had this dream about me going from house to house preaching. And in the meantime, there were actual drones trying to, trying to get us and God was shielding us from the drones. And that was a dream from several years ago. So do I think that could happen? Oh yeah. Anybody seen any of the drone footage of drones killing soldiers over in the Ukraine? Yeah, they'll follow a soldier around and sometimes they'll drop a grenade on them or literally the drone will just go down and hit and on top of them and blow up. They got drones now that they actually, that are big enough to carry robots, like little robot dogs that are armed with machine guns and have perfect facial recognition to hunt you down. And you can shoot them all day long and you're going to have to have a little more than a than a, a handgun to disable them. Oh yeah, all this stuff exists. The day is coming that the world system will put the clamp down. That's why he said the world will hate you and deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. The entire world will turn against the Christians in the end, period. Hatred, he said. He didn't say we're going to take over everything and they're going to love us and we're going to be the wealthiest people in the world and they're just everybody's just going to love us. That is not the Bible. Amen. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. When he was being drug off to be crucified, he said, if you if they did this to me, what do you think they're going to do to you? I don't even want to quit. <laughs> Y'all got another hour in you, right? Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. And Lord, I pray. I pray that some of these prophets that I named today will humble themselves and repent. Come out of their deception or come out of their, even if they worship the devil, even if they're, infiltrators lord you said that you know paul was persecuting the church and killing christians and you brought him to repentance and true faith and true salvation and he went from killing christians to preaching to the lost and winning people to jesus and planting churches and establishing your kingdom so lord you can save anybody we don't hate these people we don't not want them to come out of their deception and error and their evil ways. We do. But they'll never come out of it if we just keep ignoring it. So, Lord, I pray that you help us know that we have a true knowing in our spirit, in our understanding, who the true prophets are and who the false ones are, who the true teachers are and who the false ones are, who, what the true gifts are and what the counterfeit is, what the true end time Bible scenario is and not what these prophets are making up. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this truth. And I pray over your people that eyes will be awakened, especially in the charismatic Pentecostal church world that's just following these Pied Pipers. 
I pray that many will wake up and come out of it. And we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. We all know the drill. We're not going to do a song today. I'm not in a song kind of mood today. I think it should be sober mood. But y'all know the drill. You hug some necks before you leave. If you have to go and stay gone, I understand. But make sure you hug some necks. And if you want to stay, we're going to go go get you something to eat. And we're going to be downstairs eating for a little while. So you're welcome. All, everybody's welcome. So if you want to stay, you're welcome to stay. Um, this front door, if you go out to get something to eat and try to come back in here, this front door will be locked. You have to come back around the back and come in at the bottom door. That's where we eat down there. Uh, so anyway, God bless y'all. Appreciate everybody coming. I appreciate y'all being able to handle a long teaching this morning. Um, we might get back to the hour ones. I don't know. It's possible. <laughs> anyway, for those that keep begging me to go for an hour and a half, two hours, you're welcome. All right. All right. God bless y'all. Be praying this week. Amen.